All right, Sagar, what's on your radar? Well, Ryan, I was sad not to be with all of you over the last few days, but it actually served as a nice purpose of getting some reflection, especially in the midst of a major news cycle. Back to a tense time in America, in the midst of the guilty verdict of Officer Derek Chauvin, who murdered George Floyd. Immediately, the takes were flying. One side basically decided Chauvin was innocent, just to own the libs. The other decided that even though Chauvin was literally found guilty, it didn't mean anything at all. I was struck by just how awful our politics was whenever I was watching that happen, as friends sparred online. That even in the event of a desirous result, that people still have to go to their selective camps and basically pretend that the result didn't happen, and then just continue to have the same fight over and over again. It was the latest feature of what I've talked a lot about since the November 2020 election, that the culture wars are basically the only thing fueling American politics, and it is killing us from the inside out. Nate Cohn of the New York Times is out with an excellent new analysis, empirically demonstrating just how far down the abyss that we are headed with the rise of political sectarianism. Sectarian is a word I never thought I would use when talking about American politics. It's one of the earliest parts of my career, writing about the Iraq War, and while those sectarian lines were literally religious in America. Now, we are slowly starting to look a lot more like the tribes of the Levant than the heterogeneous democracy that we were set up to be. America was founded to escape the idiocy of the European monarchical system where they literally fought 30 years wars over religion. And yet, things actually might be worse here than in Europe some 250 years later. Cohn points to an October Stanford University study, and it found that by some measure, sectarian division amongst Americans, quote, exceeds long-standing antipathies around race and religion. Think about that. Exceeds the hatred engendered from Southern whites against blacks during Jim Crow, and exceeds the hatred of Protestants versus Catholics. Considering that both of those hatreds led to literal widespread violence in U.S. history, this seems bad. Another key sentence was this, quote, out-party hate has become more powerful than in-party love as a predictor of voting behavior. That's the key. For most people, it's not about voting for something that you like. It's about terror that the person or the side that you see as existentially evil will take power and, more importantly, take something away from you. In short, what we're losing is the most basic American principle. This is poisoning almost every aspect of American life. Cohn points to a new implicit association test in which Republicans and Democrats say that political affiliation alone is enough to bias people away from hiring someone if they disagree based on the label. Another recent poll from CBS News it found that more than half of Republicans and more than 40% of Democrats tend to think of the other as, quote, enemies. More than half and 40% of Democrats that's basically the largest chunk of both parties. And the reason why is that all of us have become far too political. One of the worst developments of the last 20 years is the creation of, quote, mega identities around politics. Being Republican, Democrat, progressive, whatever. It isn't just what you believe. It's literally who you are. And when you, who you are is diametrically opposed to someone else, the only logical conclusion is war. Think about this. Partisan Republicans surveyed in March said that they had heard far more about Dr. Seuss than they did about the $1.9 trillion stimulus package. They weren't really familiar at all with the contours of that bill, but they knew in detail the latest developments of the Dr. Seuss controversy. Why? Because Dr. Seuss was part of a clash of group identities in which one side sees the existence of old tone-deaf comics as violence, the other as a rapidly escalating campaign to rewrite America itself. Right now, one third of Americans think that violence is justifiable for achieving political ends, which means a third of the country basically no longer believes that our institutions are capable of functioning. I'm not saying or showing you any of this to bum you out, only to say that we need to really ask ourselves what role that we each play in this dynamic and self-consciously <clears throat> exiting. It would be very easy for me to do an entire monologue on how the left is crazy and wants to destroy America after the Chauvin verdict. And it would get a lot of views. And Crystal or Ryan, they could do a whole thing on how the right are terrible fascists and they want to destroy America, and that would go viral too. But what's the point? It doesn't serve any end. Ask yourself whether you have played a role in this dynamic. And if you have, it's okay. I certainly have too. I freely admit to it. 
But the emotions of feeling under assault are powerful. They are hardwired into us. But if we succumb to them, then we deserve our violent fate. Instead, in the most tense times, look not to add fuel to the fire, but to think about how, if you were to encounter someone from the other side, that you might at least try and make them understand your point of view in a calm and rational manner. And we have failed many times in our history to do that. That's our most basic task. We've always paid the price. Our current political leadership, from Nancy Pelosi to Joe Biden to Kevin McCarthy or Donald Trump, they are not going to get out of this one. They are the ones who created this mess in the first place. Look elsewhere, inward and outside, because that's where I truly believe that the future is. Ryan, this thing really scared the hell out of me, this political sectarian piece. And it's not that I didn't know anything, but like putting those things together. And especially because I spent so much of my early career thinking about Iraq, being like, oh, what the hell? Number one, why the hell do we go? So number two, how the hell did you create this mess? One of my favorite books on the subject was Fiasco by Tom Ricks. And I think the opening line is that like Iraq was probably always going to be terrible, but it didn't have to be a fiasco. And one of the reasons that it became a fiasco is because we exacerbated and created the conditions for sectarian civil war. And I see now the rise of political sectarianism here as just so much worse. Right. I mean, immediately, right? Like, I, see, I see people I know who are like, Chauvin is in his, I'm like, what do you do? Did you watch the same video that I did? And then the same thing, like the justice system is fake. There's no such thing as justice. But I'm like, excuse me? So then what was the point of the trial at all? And immediately, like that, it, within seconds of the, not even the verdict, within seconds of the announcement that a verdict had been reached, it's the same thing over and over again, right? And what, what good does that serve anybody? And, and reading this article in the context of that, it just put it all together. I was like, there's, we were talking about earlier in the show, uh, Republican state legislators want to criminalize Black Lives Matter protests. The post office is spying on Parler. FBI has whole, you know, sp spooks embedded with like every group in this country. Where does this lead? It's not good. And I think that this is, it's an outgrowth of where we are right now yeah. uh, with politics. And, I, and in, in, in Iraq, when yeah. it came to sectarianism, what you have is a guilt by association. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if you are part of this particular sect, tribe, yeah. doesn't matter. Uh, have to be know, killed. You, yeah. you have to be killed. And you, are, you are presumed to be guilty and to mm -hmm. ha have all the same beliefs, political, religious, ideological, as everybody else in, in that tribe, in that sect, in that, in that uh, sub-religion. Yeah. We do that here. And I think the one thing that people can try to do is push back against this guilt by association tendency. Yes. I don't even remember what the argument, stupid argument I was having online the other day was. But <laughs> shouldn't somebody, do that, Ryan. Right, you shouldn't do it. Somebody yeah. was saying, yeah. somebody kept sending me, yeah. your argument is the yeah. same as this person. Yes. Yeah. And sh shame on you for making a similar argument to this other person. I had never heard of this other person. Mm -hmm. I, and we're all expected to have heard of every single person. Right. And then we're also expected to know what those people argue. And then we're also expected to know that therefore those arguments are verboten <laughs> across the board. Right. And I'm like, I, I refuse to even find out who this person is because mm -hmm. this is my idea. I'm not the first person that had yes. this idea. I'm not the last person that had the idea. Tell me on its merits what is wrong with the idea. Yeah. Don't tell me that the idea is bad because it is shared by someone who also has other ideas that I might agree actually I, are bad. I know. I don't want to. I don't want to he even hear about who this person is. Just tell me what's going on. And so if you can just separate. And if you see people doing that, don't participate in it. And also, stop worrying so much about getting mobbed <laughs> yeah. because the numbers that you see feel a lot more powerful oh, yeah. than it's they fake. than they right. actually are. Like the the down votes and the and the replies. Mm -hmm. so you, even if it's dozens, that's dozens out of millions. Right. And, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people in this country, there are far more people that agree with you and that are staying silent. So don't don't be one of those. Hey, I completely agree. It's basic, basically why I left Twitter. Uh, and everybody on the internet should remember Smart the 99-1 principle, which is 90% never do anything, 9% may upvote, downvote, or whatever. Only 1% ever are going to comment. So who the hell knows who those people are? And actually, right after I wrote this, one of my friends sent me this article, which is that most Democrats who are considering a relationship would not consider dating a Trump voter. And that is at 
a se- 74% of Democrats say they wouldn't. And 57, look, it's not just them. It's just more than Republicans. 57% of Republicans say they wouldn't consider voting a Democrat. How are we supposed to live together? It's not right. possible. And I see that, look, because we live in D.C., we live with, you know, what is it, 95% liberal city or whatever. You see it on its most extreme here. But I think we set the trends and these filter down through our society. And it is just, it is literally poisoning us. Poisoning us. The worst possible thing we could do is give into it, end up criminalizing each other and hating each other even more. And there's no good that comes from any of it. Anyway, I can't wait to hear what's on your mind, Ryan. That's next.